Perfect. Hello, everyone. This is uh, the Young Neurosurgeons webinar, episode number one. So you want to be a neurosurgeon. I'm Jeremiah Johnson. I'm the current chair of the Young Neurosurgeons Committee. I'm here with a distinguished panel, several guest speakers um, who will go through all their credentials in a moment. But I just wanted to introduce ourselves to everyone um, informally. Um, the idea behind this webinar is to, especially in these years where there's less local structure due to COVID, things like Grand Rounds and, and the ability to interact with residents and things like that uh, is, less, is less, we have less capability to do that, to have an online forum to give people information that would maybe usually be uh, handed down in person from local medical schools and neurosurgery residencies. And now we have uh, these great online capabilities to help spread that information, potentially in a vacuum where there's not as much person-to-person -person interaction between uh, medical students, uh, undergrads, and, and neurosurgeons um, in the training pipeline. So um, that said, um, I want to kind of quickly go over a little bit of the background of who we all are, um, both as an organization and as individuals. So I'm going to share my screen. And it should hopefully work here. There we go. All right, so welcome to the, uh, so you wanna be a neurosurgeon, episode number one of the Young Neurosurgeons webinars. Um, the goal of this is to provide all of you guys with this information, education, and to some degree inspiration towards uh, pursuing a career in neurosurgery. One of the things that I think a lot of us talk about is that um, as we meet more and more distinguished neurosurgeons, we realize that um, they're not that much different than us. And so it kind of demystifies a little bit this, this big gap you have that these majestic names that you've heard for your, your whole training are this this is unachievable for you so we're hoping in a similar way that if you guys kind of hear our stories and how we got through um from from you know babies in the academic sense through the neurosurgery um, pipeline into where we are today that maybe that'll be inspirational to you um these are some things we're basically going to cover today what is neurosurgery what do we do length of training subspecialties what are the residency programs? Where are they? How many of them are there? Um, what do you have to do to get board certified? What kind of jobs do you have when you graduate? What are the characteristics of a future neurosurgeon that we're looking for when we're looking for trainees? And then how did we get there so that you maybe know how you might be able to get there? Before I get too much further, I wanted to say that this is the first in a series of these talks. Um, and then the first few webinars are focused on medical students and how that you can go from an interest to actually matching in neurosurgery. So episode number two will be next Thursday, October 8th. Dr. Wolf, who uh, has a particular expertise in these matters um, due to her both pr program director status uh, in her residency program, as well as the chair of the senior society. She doesn't look like she's a senior. She's invited to the senior society. Um, so the group that controls a lot of these decisions, um, she's the, in charge of the medical student committee of the senior society so she has great insight to these issues and we're happy she's joining us next week don't forget to register we'll try and put um, all the registration information on our social media so you can follow us there i believe anna who i'll introduce here in a moment is also going to put it in the q a section of the webinar and um, that way you can click and register for next week's episode uh, sooner than later uh, so follow us on social media for updates and all these things. We're hoping that these recordings will be, be uploaded on YouTube, the NREF's YouTube page, which we will also link to on our social media for watching later or sharing with others who may benefit from this information. Um, so just to give you a background, if you're un unfamiliar, many of you may be familiar, but if you're not, what is the AANS? It's the American Association of Neuro Neurological Surgeons. It was founded in 1931 by who everyone can pretty much uniformly considers the father of neurosurgery, Harvey Cushing. Um, it's a scientific and educational association. It has about more than 10,000 members worldwide. Um, it also has the general, um, has many, 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 many hats it wears and things that it does. But in general, it guides the field of neurosurgery and kind of directs where we go as a field. It includes education, uh, which is a big emphasis, advocacy, and promoting the highest quality of patient care amongst neurosurgeons. Um, what is the Young Neurosurgeons Committee? So we are a committee of the AANS that is focused on providing um, representation for young neurosurgeons into the AANS 
and um, being able to speak to their leadership about concerns of young nurse surgeons. Young nurse surgeons are medical students that are interested in nurse surgery, residents that are training, and young attendings within about the first five years after training. So one of the things that we do is that we get to interact with um, the senior leadership and the organization in general, and this helps develop future leaders of neurosurgery. And also, like we said, provides a channel for young nurses to impact the direction of the specialty. What is NREF? NREF sponsors this. Um, so NREF is, is a uh, not-for-profit arm of the WNS uh, Research and Education Foundation. And it is uh, created by the WNS and it supports basic science, clinical research, as well as education. Many, many residents go to courses sponsored by NREF to learn technical aspects of neurosurgery. And we're very, very happy to have them sponsor this educational session as well. Um, today's speakers, by way of introduction, they're here with us. They're going to hear them finally uh, now that I'm done droning along. Um, Ms. Dr. Stacy Katera Wolf, she's Associate Professor and Radi Residency Director of the um, at Wake Forest University, Department of Neurosurgery. She's also Director of Neurointerventional Surgery. Um, and as we mentioned before, she's in the Senior, senior Neurosurgical Society, uh, the Chair of the Medical Student Committee. She's also a prior Chair of the Young Nurses Committee. So I guess she's a Chair alumni. You have a lot of titles today, Stacey. Um, Edja Indum, who is Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery at Emory University. He also has a brain tumor immunotherapy lab, which I believe he will talk about. And he is also a former chair of the Young Nurses Committee, making him a chair alumni as well. So welcome to both of you and thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Um, just a quick introduction to some of the panelists. David Dornbos, he's our vice chair of the Young Nurses Committee. He's interested in endovascular and open cerebrovascular. Um, he's currently at the Sims Murphy Clinic at University of Texas Health Science Center in Memphis. And Mwalavan Sivakumar, who's the current secretary of the YNC, who will ascend to become the chair shortly, as my time here is nigh. In the spring, he'll be taking over um, as chair. He's a director of uh, neurosurgery in, at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, um, and as well as the little sister of Mary, or little company of Mary. I always wonder where the large company of Mary is, Wally. Uh, I assume it's in the Vatican. Um, so he's the assistant professor uh, of neurosurgery at the John Wayne Cancer Institute. And then finally joining us from the WNS Medical Student Chapter at Wake Forest are Anthony Enzalone and Keon Peterson, who are the Vice Chair and Treasurer of that uh, WNS Medical Student Chapter, respectively. So thank you all for joining us. Finally, Ana Guadalupe Rodriguez Armendarias. I hope I said that right. She is uh, one of the people that proposed this webinar series to us and has done a tremendous amount of work to bring it to us. And I wanna especially acknowledge her. She will be collecting all the questions that you have. Please enter them into the Q&A section on Zoom. She will curate through them and ask us those questions at the end of this session. So we're gonna have me rambling on, Stacy, Edge Talk, and time for the panelists to ask questions and discuss, and also a time for, um, for questions and answers. So please enter your question and answers there. Also, um, I'm hopeful Anna can enter in the link for next week's webinar so that you can go ahead and register for that. So you'll have that link now. And uh, at the end, we'll have an email for any feedback you may have um, that you can send us an email as well. Finally, please take the pre-survey. Um, if you haven't already, you can do it next week. Um, so that we can keep track of, of people's before and after um, webinar uh, views of the field and, and of this course so we can get some good feedback and improve ourselves going forward. All right, so that is all I have to say at the beginning. I appreciate everyone's patience while I go through that background. Again, um, I want to turn this over to Dr. Stacy Wolf, who's going to share her screen with us and has going to enlighten us with all about an introduction in neurosurgery. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, this has been a amazing journey and you'll hear a little bit about uh, just the wonderful times that I've had becoming a neurosurgeon. Uh, I am just absolutely thrilled to be able to be here uh, in a, a past past 
past chair alumni status. Uh, but it is, it is something that's really neat and very special. Um, and whether you're thinking about neurosurgery and just not sure yet, whether you say neurosurgery is my thing and, and I'm uh, going in that way, I think there's definitely something that we can all learn. I had a good time uh, today as I was kind of finalizing some of the talk and, and going through um, my memoirs as a chief resident in Miami. Everybody kind of gives their uh, a summary of what they did in their seven years. Um, and it was very interesting to see my last slide, uh, which are all the things, the lessons learned. And I tell you what, they really, they really haven't changed. They're all still things that I'm striving to do. Um, but uh, as, as way of background, you know, neurosurgery is a pretty small specialty. Uh, and you'll see that there's about 4,000 neurosurgeons in the U.S. And we all have our pedigrees, if you will, but um, really we're a pretty significant family. And so, you know, for me, it was really special. I was able to train under Dr. Roberto Quiros uh, as my program director in Miami. And he's actually uh, one of the people that got the young neurosurgeons started off uh, back in the day. Um, you know, and I was able to then, you know, ascend and learn uh, through the leadership of the young neurosurgeons. Um, and it was pretty exciting to see my junior resident, Jeremiah, um, who I got to uh, work with as a medical student, you'll see a picture of that, uh, but uh, to see him now ascending through the young neurosurgeons and sooner or later he's going to be an old neurosurgeon. So very, very exciting stuff. So I'll speaking, point that out again. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of uh, history, uh, as Jeremiah knows, it's very important that we know our history, where we're coming from. Um, and whether this is something that you've never really thought about neurosurgery, you want to know a little bit more, and certainly if you're somebody who wants to do neurosurgery, you have to have an understanding of where it is that we're coming from. So don't worry, we're not going to spend a ton of time here, but just kind of really a brief overview of where neurosurgery has come from. Uh, you know, so 10,000 years ago, we're drilling holes in people's skull. Uh, and then not that long ago, you know, Galen, uh, obviously a great anatomist uh, with all of this, but he was doing trepanation for hydrocephalus. Um, you know, we then slowly but surely, most people have heard of shunts, right? And shunts actually started by putting horsehair into the ventricle and then just creating a fistula that it could keep leaking out. Uh, so we have come a large way and there's still a large way for us to go. Um, but these are some of the names that you might uh, hear and that you should know. I was just talking about Sir Victor Horsley today as we were using some bone wax in the OR. Um, Harvey Cushing, of course. So Harvey Harvey Cushing, uh, you know, is over. Can you see my mouse? I don't know. You can. Oh, great. So Harvey Cushing is over here. This is Sir Victor Horsley. And then, of course, Dandy, uh, you know, and Dandy was a uh, Cushing student um, and really uh, detailed very nicely for us. CSF came up with new encephalography, um, did the first aneurysm clipping. So, of course, near and dear to my heart uh, as a cerebrovascular surgeon. And then Wilder Penfield, of course, bringing us into kind of modern day uh, neurosurgery, uh, describing the homunculus and really modern epilepsy surgery. So these are some of the names uh, and the, the giants whose shoulders that we stand on. So who can be a neurosurgeon? Um, you. You can be a neurosurgeon. Uh, and this is really exciting to be part of this panel. Even when I started neurosurgery, I was the second woman to go through uh, the program. Um, you know, it was a pretty, pretty um, standard group of folks uh, in, in the way that people looked. And I think it's really exciting and important that we are starting to look like the patients that we serve. We still have a long way to go. There's no question about that. But I think the AANS and the young neurosurgeons have really been dedicated to growing diversity. Um, you know, and in the time that I've been doing this, we've gone from 4% of, uh, you know, women to 10% of women neurosurgeons. The trainees have uh, doubled, over doubled since I've been uh, at this. Um, you know, and we have a great group of people who are coming up who are just not all white men. And we, that is a very important demographic, there's no question. Uh, but again, we want to look like the patients that we serve and, and we're getting there. So this is my department at Wake Forest. Uh, very proud of all of these uh, guys and gals. So 
what do neurosurgeons do? Uh, we do all the things. And, you know, I think over, over here uh, on the left side of the screen, you're a physician, you're a surgeon, you're a teacher, uh, and you're an innovator. And whether that is bench research, whether that's clinical trials, patents, uh, you know, you do a little bit of all of this. And, and there's really such emphasis on, on teaching and innovator. And through all of that, you're a leader. Um, and so this is a picture of my uh, group. I think Kian's actually in here uh, as we were making videos for the medical student boot camp uh, on how to position patients. Um, this is kind of, this is a day in the life of me. I've got a little rat work going on. We have some cells and I coil an aneurysm, you know, and so it really is, it's a fun specialty because you do get to do everything. Um, and then here are the subspecialties. Uh, you know, we've got spine, we've got cerebrovascular surgery, and that can look like both open and endovascular or through the vessel surgery. You've got tumors or neuro-oncology, and that, of course, is cranial and spine, uh, and radio surgery, gamma knife, cyber knife, these kinds of things, and I feel like daily we're making advances there. There's skull-based surgery, uh, pediatric neurosurgery, of course, and then functional and pain is just a huge field that's opening up with seizure surgery or epilepsy surgery and uh, deep brain stimulation you know, for all kinds of different things. And then of course, peripheral nerve, right? Neurosurgeons take care of the brain, the spine, and then all of the supporting structures, uh, vessels and um, uh, vessels and bone with that, and then the peripheral nerves. And then neurocritical care is absolutely a, a, a subspecialty for us. So this is a picture montage of what cerebrovascular surgery looks like. In 15 minutes, I clearly cannot go through uh, where I got to where I am, as well as all of the subspecialties. But this is just kind of, you know, some of the things that I get to do. You know, you get to clip the aneurysm. You get to go up and coil the aneurysm. We throw in a pipeline device. This is, this is a fun that we had. This is long ago, a technique that we really don't use that much because we have flow diversion. But this is a technique called balloon bounce that when I was a fellow, we got to develop. And then we were able to illustrate this and get it on a cover of the Journal of Neurosurgery. You know, going, going through and doing different uh, approaches for things that are hard to get to. Tumor embolization chemo for retinoblastoma, intraarterial chemo, and of course, you know, still being able to, to go ahead and just do a standard carotid endarterectomy. It's, it's fun, just a lot of fun stuff. In spinal surgery, you've got trauma, you've got uh, open surgery for tumor, you've got degenerative uh, scoliosis, you know, you can fix, fix things stem to stern. We've got some minimally invasive. You know, there's again, just a little bit of everything. Neuro-oncology, um, you know, really so much going on there, whether you're talking about, you know, pituitary adenomas, whether you're talking about metastasis, whether you're talking about these big gnarly, this, this is all one, one group here, you know, where we're able to take out this huge tumor. But now we've got, uh, you know, really exciting things going on with immunotherapy and vaccines. Uh, you know, of course, here we have to represent uh, radiosurgery. So just so much thing, stuff going on. And then, of course, over here, who doesn't love a laser? You know, we've got lit or equivalent, you know, where we're able to put in small probes and superheat, you know, these tumors and treat things that way. Um, and that can also be used for epilepsy and a variety of different things. Functional, this is a very brief smattering and overview of, you know, the deep brain stimulation, the, you know, really understanding how the brain works at a molecular and cell level and then being able to modulate that. Um, and just really, really tremendous. And, and we've, just scratched the surface. And, and that's what's so exciting about neurosurgery is that there's just, you know, you, you can go and you're going to develop something new. I mean, it's, it's almost a guarantee if that's something that you want to be able to do to understand the brain better and to treat your patients better. So what does training to be a neurosurgeon look like? Um, it's not necessarily the shortest road of those that you can pick, but it really is great fun. You know, in general, medical school is four years, and then neurosurgery residency is seven years. And that basically looks like your first year, uh, you're a, an intern, you've got six months of neurosurgery, about three months of general surgery, and then three months of neurocritical care and neurology to really get a basis and understanding for what it is that we do. Your PGY, uh, that should say two 
two and three year, you're the junior resident, you're on the floor, you're in the ICU, you're doing standard OR cases, learning the approaches, learning how to close. Um, most uh, programs, although not all, will have your PGY four year be a research year, but there are some variations on the theme there without a doubt. Uh, your fifth and sixth year, you're the senior resident, you're in the OR, you're, you're doing what we love to do and operating. And then your seventh year, you, you're a chief resident. Um, there are some programs, uh, if you are, you know, really tracking well and hitting all of your milestones, that you have the opportunity to do an enfolded fellowship uh, and have your chief resident year be in the PGY6 year. So there's a lot of different opportunities there. You know, within training, you're doing, obviously, didactics, you're doing um, labs, you are operating, you're in the OR. This picture down here, this was our virtual intern boot camp this year, a little bit different than we've done in the past, certainly, but we had both a virtual uh, um, symposium, if you will, and then we did hands-on training, uh, you know, and, and learn stuff. How, how do you put in an EVD? How do you do a lumbar drain? This kind of uh, bedside type procedure. And then for some folks, they're going to want to subspecialize a little bit more. If you go through and do neuro neurosurgery residency, you are going to be an outstanding uh, general neurosurgeon and really able to do the breadth of neurosurgery. But there are some people that want to do a little bit more subspecialty. You want to focus your research in that area. You want to go in to academics and really focus your practice in one area. And then a fellowship uh, is a possibility. And really, there's a fellowship in every single one of those subspecialty areas that we talked about. Stacey, would you mind just kind of describing like Absolutely. maybe a foreign term to some some people? What exactly yes. is that? You this know, is an excellent, case? excellent question. So um, what a fellowship is, is a fellowship is a year of focused practice. You are doing um, primarily uh, that subspecialty. So for instance, if you want to do uh, cerebrovascular uh, or neuroendovascular, there is a specific tract for that uh, where you have to have your 200 diagnostic cases and then you're able to come in and do, uh, you know, with a mentor in that subspecialty area do a year of uh, training in that one section, could be spine, could be pediatrics. Um, and so, and then you come out with basically a certificate of focused practice um, so that you can, you know, do those things at whatever hospital that you go to. All neurosurgeons will learn how to do some neuroendovascular. All neurosurgeons will learn how to do some degree of deformity surgery. But uh, you're going usually someplace outside of your home institution to learn some new tips and tricks, uh, you know, from from other folks who specialize in the area. Is that kind this, of this is a voluntary a voluntary extra year that you go through? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, and there are some some people that do, uh, myself included, you, you just glutton for punishment, can't quite get enough, you know, and so you do a open cerebrovascular skull based fellowship and then you do a neuroendovascular fellowship, you know, so, so there's a lot of different things and it really depends on what what uh, your goals are and that's going to change. I will definitely say, you know, most people when they come into medical school, um, either don't know what they're going to do or have an idea that then trains changes sometime in residency training. And some of that's the mentors that you get uh, get keyed in with and, and some of it is just, you know, really learning the different subspecialties and, and developing a passion for one or more of them. So, so yeah, so you know, as far as my journey, uh, this is a picture montage of my journey through into and through neurosurgeon neurosurgery to date. So I had the opportunity to really just have an incredible family, very supportive. My mom's a microbiologist. My dad is a dentist. You can see here uh, in the in the picture with the grass hut and all of the toothbrushes. Um, one of the things that I was able to do with my dad uh, starting in high school was to go. Um, and travel with him and do medical missions uh, or dental missions as the case may be. And so, you know, between the, between the two of us, we have literally taken out thousands of teeth uh, in, <laughs> in uh, South America and the Caribbean. Um, and so, you know, that was something that was really special and, and gave me just a, a passion to, to help out folks that just needed, needed a little bit of help. Um, definitely, I loved being on the procedural side of things. I think, you know, who should be a neurosurgeon? People that have intellectual curiosity, uh, people that have um, 
you know, tenacity, a pat, an, an initiative and a passion to learn and to push and to grow. Um, you definitely have to be a little bit of a self-starter. That really is very helpful, um, you know, and then just really wanting to pursue excellence, uh, you know, in, in all aspects of what it is that you're doing. Um, and so that gave me a little bit of a, a taste of this. And, you know, then I was able to, um, I was a Navy kid, my dad was in the Navy, so we lived all over the place. Um, and I was able to go to the University of Missouri at Kansas City, the only NCAA marsupial mascot. Uh, so go Bruce. Um, but <laughs> it was a six-year program that really gave me that hands-on training uh, you know early on and did allow me to do a lot of the medical missions work so then I went to um, I was in the Navy at the time I did my internship in San Diego um, and was fortunate enough to match uh, with Miami and Dr. Heroes that you can see here you know was my program direct director and my mentor um, as well as Dr. Green and Dr. Morcos you know just so many mentors uh, you know that were that took the time to invest in me and that's something that uh, you know I'll always try to do um, you know for for my mentees um, but uh, that was really an eye-opening experience. Dr. Heroes built what he called the Band of Brothers. Now we have Bands of Brothers and Sisters. Um, but that was something that was really important, that we were very close with our, um, our, resident, our fellow residents and, and colleagues. Uh, you know, and you got through things together. And they really served as examples. And you, know, you can see here in the middle, this is Dr. Bhatia, um, you know, who unfortunately has passed away. I worked with him a lot in Haiti. Uh, we were able to go down. And while those cases don't count for your, your case log, um, I learned so much from going down and doing surgery with next to nothing um, and doing all of the jobs. You know, you can see him there mopping the floor. It's something that I, I still do every now and again uh, in my OR at Wake Forest. And it's something that really is, it takes the whole team. Um, as a surgeon, as a neurosurgeon, you're the leader of the team. And that's something that's really stuck with me. Um, but I was able to go down to Haiti uh, three, four different times. Um, you can see me with this this uh, sweet sweet little girl. This was a, Dr. Ragam and Dr. Batia, you know, really got this going where they saw a need um, and their goal was never to go down and kind of come in as, as the saviors. It was to create something that, you know, allowed a mechanism for them to be able to ultimately uh, have somebody down there that is Haitian and trained and take care of themselves. And they really got me uh, excited about the idea of educating, um, you know, and so that's something that's really special now that they, they have a residency that's, uh, you know, very closely entwined with the University of Miami. You know, and they're training uh, Haitian surgeons to be able to do this amazing work. Um, another thing that I was able to do, I was able after Hurricane Katrina, which is now many years ago, but you'll see in this bottom picture uh, me sweating to death because it's hot. It was hotter than all get out down there. But you'll see this little med student standing behind me with the blonde hair. That is Dr. Johnson. Uh, he came and did his uh, fourth year sub eye uh, when this when this hurricane came through and just decimated Gulfport, Mississippi. And so our chair at the time, Dr. Green, I was on research. He said, Stacy, you got to get a team together and go down and help these people. And I, I said, oh, okay. And so I started trying to find people. Well, you know, you can see here's my, this is uh, Ryan Trombley. He was my, um, co-resident at the time and uh, so we were both on research I said all right we're gonna go down there I said I need somebody else I need another doctor I said Jeremiah we got to go down there he said I'm in my sub eye I've got to meet all of the attendings I've got to you know do all the things so that I can get my letters I said look if you come down and work hard you're gonna care of your letters. Yeah. <laughs> so I kidnapped him literally we flew in a plane down to Gulfport, Mississippi, and uh, we did some really crazy and amazing work uh, for a week that really had nothing to do with neurosurgery, but everything to do with the spirit of why we do what we do. Uh, you know, and, and that's one of the things I love about neurosurgery is, you know, you don't go into neurosurgery to be a prima donna, pick a different specialty. You know, go in there because you have to know everything. You have to know how to do anesthesia. You have to be able to intubate your patients. You have to know radiology. You have to be an amazing internist, um, you know, and it's just, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So then I, then I uh, graduated and I got to go into the Navy. Uh, I had two kids, as you can see here. 
and uh, amazing, amazing husband who keeps everything working for us. I spent four years at Triple Army Medical Center, um, and then I came back to Wake Forest, or I came to Wake Forest, uh, and I'm program director here. Um, it's been a really neat journey. When I came, I wanted to come back to doing research. Now, how did I get into research? That was all Dr. Heroes. Um, I had no desire to do research. As you can see, I liked helping people, um, you know, and, and so I, I wanted to just take care of people. And, and so when it came to be my PGY3, and I'm looking forward to my PGY4 research year, I went and I had a nice talk with Dr. Heroes. I said, sorry, I don't really want to do research. You know, I'll do some clinical research. And he got, he got very big when he was uh, upset. He, he grew and he said, you will do research. And I said, yes, sir. I'm going to be very excited about doing research. And so I went and I tried to find the project that I thought I could get a poster out of and check off research done. Uh, and so I looked around and, you know, Miami, there's the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, and they're working very hard at it yet. I don't believe it's cured. Uh, but that was not, that was not going to get me a quick poster. I wanted something that was actually working. And so I found this wonderful uh, PhD, Mary Eaton, and she was working on pain. Now, Dr. Levy told me pain is not sexy, and I do agree with him. It's not terribly sexy. However, it was successful. And so I was able to get a poster. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I fell in love with research. Uh, and just the idea of being able to do something better, you know, and research can look like a lot of things. I will never say that I'm going to be the person that is going to come up with this brilliant new idea. That's Edge's job. Um, but I am able to take something, somebody that somebody else has worked on, and then make it be very pragmatic. You know, it's not working so well in animals. How can we go ahead and make this, uh, you know, work in humans? And how can we take something that's human, an actual human disease, and make that applicable. And so I was able to learn how to do that. And after the Navy, I was able to come back to Wake Forest and start uh, start working on that. Um, additionally, I was able to uh, take, take over the um, residency program. And so, you know, we were able to get all the residents just working, working, really hard and doing a great job. Um, you know, they asked me to talk about the written board and the oral board. It's too early. You don't have to worry about that right now. But essentially, there is a written board that you take in your, um, oh, thank you very much. That's Dr. Wilson. He is the uh, president of the AANS. And clearly, we're both working late tonight. So, um, but, uh, you know, the, the written board basically is something that you take somewhere between your PGY three and five year, just depending on the program. The oral board you take several years out uh, after you've graduated and, and you present your cases there. And, um, you know, both are basically designed to increase your knowledge, increase the public trust that you know what you're doing as a neurosurgeon, um, but definitely very, very doable. But you can see, you know, with these pictures, my two little kiddos, you know, I, I do stroke, right? And so stroke, uh, stroke is never scheduled. And so I'm on call every third day, um, you know, for that. And of course, we're not coming in tons, but when you get called, you have to go right away. And so sometimes we're at the Children's Museum or at church or who knows where else, and we got to go. And so we're able to, uh, you know, sometimes my kiddos come with me and um, this is the Cal Lab. It's our practice OR, if you will. So whenever we have to run to the hospital to do a stroke, the kiddos get to play on the computer. This is very exciting for them. They love computer time. And this is the only time I give it to them. And then we take a trip to the Cal Lab so that they can uh, be surgeons and they absolutely love it. So, you know, it's been a fun journey of being able to integrate my family and my work family and uh, get to do research, get to teach, um, you know, and really be a part of this amazing journey of, of organized neurosurgery, um, you know, that I've benefited from and hopefully that I'm able to help benefit the, uh, the future. So I will leave it at that. Uh, that's awesome, Stacey. Thank you so much for, for your all your wonderful experience uh, in describing these these kind of concepts for the for the students. Um, there, there are several questions. I was curious if maybe we could just pop one in because it came up a couple of times. Is more or less how do you balance so much um, OR, you know, being a program director, uh, a lab, a social and family life? I mean, how how does that look for you? Anthony and Kian will tell you not well. <laughs> <laughs> There is a lot of prayer involved. Uh, my life is a lot of um, 
a lot of unbalanced moments that ultimately create balance. Um, I think that's one thing that I've really learned is whatever you're doing, you really have to be all in at it. Um, and that is now that may mean that you feel a little schizophrenic at times because when I go home, you know, it's all right, lay the, the pager aside or the, the phone aside and my residents are going to have to wait while I'm eating dinner with my family. Um, I had a very wise uh, neurosurgeon tell me that that, you know, if you do nothing else, make that time to eat dinner with your family you know, the majority of time. And sometimes it's gonna be McDonald's. And sometimes it's going to be uh, breakfast for dinner and we're gonna have Cheerios. And sometimes we're gonna sit down together and we are going to have a competition because everything we do in my family is a competition of how many vegetables can we put into one pot and come out with soup. Uh, we hope it's soup. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's some crazy times. And then, you know, then a lot of calls are coming in. I tell the kids, all right, Mommy's got to answer these. I make the kids part of it as much as is possible. You know, my kids know how to read a uh, rapid scan. They know what a stroke looks like and they know what penumbra is uh, because that means mommy has to go in. Uh, you know, and um, I've definitely learned how to delegate. I'm still working on it, but I have gotten much better at it. Again, Anthony and Kian can definitely attest to that. Uh, you know, but it's one of these things that, you know, share your knowledge with other people who are very capable around you and give them the opportunity to shine, right? If I do everything myself, you know, maybe I look good, but I haven't, I haven't raised all of the people around me. Um, you know, it does mean that you have to be uh, available, right? Because you can't just that you're not dumping things on people, you're, you're delegating, you're helping them, you're helping them to grow. Uh, you have to be accessible when they have questions and say, uh, Dr. Wolf, I'm not really sure what you want me to do here. But, um, and it's a team effort. That, that idea of band of brothers and sisters, that is a very real thing. Um, this is something that you go through together you know, Jeremiah and I will always be linked because we, we went through the same thing. And then I've been able to build that, you know, here at Wake Forest, uh, you know, and, and the folks coming through this. I mean, when we play softball, I mean, it's, it's a serious business. It's a serious business. And, um, you know, when we started this softball team, we, we went around and we said, all right, what's your experience? We had one kid who got kicked off his little league softball team. His dad was the coach. Uh, <laughs> The person with the most experience, she had played softball in uh, college. And so, you know, but we all learn this together and, and we just, you know, you're, you're in it. You have a good time with what you're doing. You're passionate about it um, and you enjoy it. And so my best advice to anyone who's not sure about neurosurgery, talk yourself out of it for six months. Uh, and if you can't talk yourself out of it, neurosurgery is the, th the thing for you. Um, if there's something else you could do and enjoy it, that's probably what you should be doing because, you know, I think everybody on this call would agree neurosurgeons are slightly crazy people. Um, even I would say the most normal and well-adjusted neurosurgeons are probably the functional neurosurgeons, but even them, they're still a little bit crazy. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm not so sure about that one. I, I got a few that I can counter on okay, that. Okay, fine. Uh, but <laughs> all, all nice try. Things are crazy then. They're, they're, so there is that. I would say one thing that probably links everyone is they truly love this. And so, yeah. I mean, you, you have to enjoy it if you're going to spend so much time doing it. You don't want to spend... Ed just smile there. I mean, this, this is true enjoyment. So I, I just wanted to interject here. We're going to go to Edja next. Um, so if you're listening and you didn't join at the beginning, if you have any questions, Please put them in the Q and A, and we'll we'll try to spend some time answering at the end. Um, but in in the interim, we want to kind of have like a nice smooth uh, run through the presentations, and then we'll we'll answer questions at the end. So please feel free to put in the Q and A. We're not ignoring those; we'll get to them. Um, but that's that's where we've decided to try and keep an orderly um, progression to the to the talk, and we'll have time for discussion here shortly. With that, Dr. Indum. Our associate professor, newly uh, minted Emory University Department of Neurosurgery professor, and we will we will let him uh, discuss the second part of our talk and his experience in neurosurgery. Thanks, Jeremiah, uh, and thanks, Stacy, uh, for for such a great talk. It, you know, it's it's funny. Um, you know, Stacy's one of the people that inspired me in getting into the YMC, and it was great to have her as a as a mentor and and, and bringing me through. So, you know, it's. It's always funny to kind of come for a circle and see all the people and like Wally who came behind me and, and Dormos and, and the rest. So um, it's fun getting together since we missed our opportunities to get together this year through the many meetings that we're normally sitting in. Um, so 
you you're stuck listening to me for a little bit, uh, learning about um, you know why you might want to be a neurosurgeon. I'm going to fly a little bit uh, so we can get to some of those great questions we, we saw in the chat. Um, so without further ado, this is my outline. Who should consider a career in neurosurgery? Character traits of a good neurosurgical trainee. Some of the stuff that you know uh, Dr. Wolf kind of went over as well, but some things bear repeating. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the different jobs uh, that some neurosurgeons have and how they might vary. Um, and then a little bit about my path. Um, so the first part, um, who should consider a career in, in, in neurosurgery? Um, there's actually a, a great um, uh, video, a comedy video about it's not uh, brain surgery that you should look up if you haven't seen it yet. It's kind of made the rounds in most neurosurgery circles, but um, in any case, it's not rocket science, just brain surgery. So who should consider it? Everyone. Everyone should consider it. Um, and, and here's why. Um, you know, at Columbia University School of Medicine, at one point they had a, and I think they, they still do, everybody rotated through neurosurgery in the medical school. And so everybody had to spend like a few weeks in their required rotations with, in, in part of their surgery rotation. And they would send the most medical students um, into neurosurgery at the end of the day, just for the fact that everybody got to see it, right? And neurosurgery, honestly, is so cool <laughs> that everybody should see it at least once. And you might see it and be like, that was cool one time, and that's not for me. You know, they wake up early, stay late, whatever. But try it out, get some exposure. If after that exposure and seeing these lifestyles and hearing uh, Dr. Wolf talk about eating McDonald's with their kids and knowing that my kids are eating dinner right now and I'm having this talk and you still want to do neurosurgery, then it's for you. But you'll never know if you don't give it a shot. So I, I really do think everyone should, you know, should take the time and really seriously consider a future in neurosurgery because it, it takes all types. Um, it's a very diverse field. Um, Dr. Wolf was talking about functional neurosurgeons are very different from brain tumor surgeons, are very different from vascular surgeons, which then you have your endovascular and your open vascular. And they're different types of people. And the spine surgeons that are academic are different from the private practice folks. So, you know, it really runs the gamut in the type of people that are in neurosurgery at the end of the day. So, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, when they think about a neurosurgeon and what they are, it's like, what are the characteristics of a good neurosurgeon? They're like, okay, well, yeah, you need to be like a Navy SEAL. Um, basically, you don't sleep at all. You went to Harvard, your board scores are, you know, literally can't be measured. Um, you're, you're like Einstein, you've been coming up with theories, you know, on your own. You have more publications than anyone at the NIH. Um, you can walk into a room like Sanjay Gupta and, and just give a talk, at, you know, off the top of your head. And it's very easy. And then your hands are amazing. I mean, just naturally. You don't have to practice anything. You're, you're just good to go with a photographic memory to boot. I mean, that's great. Um, but honestly, you know, being a, a good neurosurgeon is, is really, and a good neurosurgical trainee um, is like being a good person. Um, if you care about your team um, and you work hard for your team and you work hard for your patients, um, you're going to be a great trainee and everybody's going to love you. And, you know, you may not publish as much as somebody else, but you're going to be the favorite resident that every, anybody ever had because you took care of the thing that needed to be taken care of before they even thought about it. Um, so actually, I got this slide, you know, one of these things, like, you know, all I, all I learned about life, or, you know, I learned in kindergarten. Um, it's actually pretty similar um, in, in neurosurgery residency. Um, you know, the people that, you know, play fair, um, who own up to their mistakes, because um, everyone makes mistakes, um, but owns up to them right away. Um, you know, who do try and live a balanced life, who can talk about something outside of the OR because they have, you know, they have neurosurgery as a passion, but maybe they have a passion on the outside that, you know, they can talk about and talk about life and, you know, be a fun person, be a fun person to be around. Um, these things are, are important. And there's some thing in here, it's like, you know, about wonder, right? Like just being, being awed by the things that you see and, and taking a moment to appreciate being a neurosurgeon and taking a moment to appreciate that time when you're at 2 a.m. and you're tired and you're getting a case going. Um, I was operating, you know, moving into the real world from the NIH, I was operating at 1 a.m. the other day. And, um, you know, but at the moment, I was just sitting there, and I had my microscope, and I had my residence. I was back at Emory, and, uh, you know, I'd always wanted to come back to Emory's faculty, and it's like, it's 1 a.m., and I'm tired, and I loved it, and it was just like, wow, it's just so cool that I'm here, you know, handling this very serious problem in this person's brain. Um, that's not an opportunity that a lot of people have. Um, so, you know, this is actually a slide I took directly. I didn't change it at all from what I... Um, I, I took to my son's classroom when he was in first grade and did a, you know, career day. Um, and, and this is really it. Neurosurgeons are smart. I mean, you, you have to know things. There's a lot of anatomy and, you know, just neuroscience that you have to be able to master. So you, you need to feel confident that you can master that. So the confidence is also part of it. Um, at the end of the day, if you finish neurosurgery training, 
you're going to be trying to convince people that they should put themselves or the loved one in your hands um, to go at the seat of their soul into their brain and fix a problem. And if you're like, ah, you know, I'm not sure if I'm the right person for this, then there's nothing wrong with choosing something else to do. But you have to be confident in your abilities. You have to work hard. You will have to do hard work. It doesn't mean that it has to come naturally to you. But if you do the work, um, then you know it, it's something you can attain. You can become a good neurosurgeon. And you have to care. Um, you know, if you have everything else and you don't care about the outcome and you don't care about the patients and you don't care about being a good neurosurgeon, uh, at the end of the end of the day, you're you're going to fail. Um, and you will not be a good neurosurgeon and you won't be a good resident or a trainee or uh, someone that anyone's going to want to work with. So types of neurosurgery practice. Um, uh, there are many different types of practice. I've tried to boil it down into something simple, um, but this doesn't really capture everything. Um, so private practice. I have a co-resident who's in Monroe, Louisiana. He graduated, hung a shingle, and he's a neurosurgeon. And he, you know, he runs his office and he pays the bills to keep the lights on. And he hired an administrative assistant to answer the phones. And he hired a nurse to help him. And he rents time at a surgical center and has privileges at a few different hospitals and his patients have him. If he's out of town, he's got to call another neurosurgeon from a town over to maybe come in and cover. Um, you know, he, like the first couple of years, I think he didn't take vacation at all because it was just, you know, he's trying to build his practice and everything. And for some people, um, he actually had an MBA, um, loved business, loved just the idea of being in control and doing the things he wanted to do and not do the things he didn't want to do. It's perfect for him. He loves it. He loves every minute of it. Um, and if you want that kind of mighty control, then private practice might be for you. Then there's kind of hospital employed um, type uh, neurosurgeons, um, which is a, a, a really a growing segment of neurosurgeons. It used to be that if you weren't in academics, most were in some sort of private practice, either a small or a large one. Um, but a lot of neurosurgeons now are hospital employed. Depending on the hospital employed situation, it could just be you at some hospitals. It could be you in a small group. It could be a large subspecialized practice. Um, there are some private practices that own enough, a big enough surgery center or something that they have a big private practice that they all own together, um, but it's subspecialized and almost looks like an academic center. Um, if you are actually truly hospital employed, you probably don't have much administrative uh, responsibility. Someone just gives you a salary. You don't have to count the packages of gauze and that sort of thing. But you're also going to be a little bit more limited in the ceiling, probably, of, of what you earn as a, compared to a private practice neurosurgeon. There are no starving neurosurgeons in the United States. However, these are the things that you have to think about. If you, you know, really want to go and you know, spend all your time in the OR in order to get your receipts up, you maybe don't see as much of the return from that as a hospital-employed surgeon. You probably have some component of a, a production uh, a bonus, um, but it's not the same as you bill it, you take the money, and if you don't, then you don't. Um, and then there's academic practice. And, you know, most neurosurgeons or people thinking about neurosurgery, I think, think about academic practice because that's what you're exposed to first. Um, that's where the residents are. That's where everybody trained. But even that is very diverse. Um, so it goes everywhere from the private which almost looks exactly like the hospital employed neurosurgeon, except maybe a resident rotates through um, their practice from time to time, maybe not even all the time, but maybe half the year they have a resident or something like that. Um, then you have, you know, kind of a clinical academic surgeon, which is probably the most uh, academic surgeons who, um, you know, maybe their scholarship is uh, case studies there are, um, you know, uh, a large case series, um, registries, um, coming up with new techniques, uh, putting out videos, teaching residents. Um, most academic neurosurgeons don't actually teach classes, um, but their academic component of being a teacher is teaching the residents and medical students that come through the operating room. Um, most times, even in a clinical academic neurosurgery practice, it's very subspecialized. The vascular neurosurgeon, endovascular, open vascular, open skull base, endoscopic skull base, um, you know, maybe intraax intraaxial glioma surgeon, and whatever combinations. There are some academic practices that have more of a general practice where whatever comes in on call, they take care of it. It just depends on, on where you are. Um, and then, you know, they may run some clinical trials, um, you know, tumor trials or pain trials or deep brain stimulator trials um, supported by industry or maybe the NIH. Um, this is what I know the most about because this is what I am. It's, it's kind of a neurosurgeon scientist model um, where you are trying to, at the same time, run a lab, attract funding, get grants, publish papers, and also be a practicing neurosurgeon. Um, this obviously works best if you are 
clinical practice and your academic scholarly practice are very well meshed. Um, so for example, I do some studies in mice where I'm looking at immune therapies and how they uh, mice might respond to a given therapy with a tumor. Um, I also run clinical trials, early phase cl clinical trials where, where I may use the same type of treatments I was using in the mice in patients. And then I might operate on those patients in the clinical trial, which also helps build my clinical practice. And so, and then I might take tissue from that, study that in the lab, and that might give me the idea for the next thing I treat a mouse with. So it kind of goes back and forth. It's very difficult to be a spine surgeon who studies brain tumors. Um, so trying to have some harmonization of that as you go through your training often makes sense. Um, if you're thinking about becoming a neurosurgeon, you do not need to pick a subspecialty right now um, or even a type of practice, academic, et cetera. But these are the sorts of things um, you know, to think about in the future. Uh, so what's my typical day look like if, if I'm operating? Um, you know, uh, I might do a couple glioma surgeries, be done by two, three o'clock, then head back to the lab, work on papers, that sort of thing. Um, you know, if it's a clinic, I might again, have a half day clinic and then half the day back in my lab. So that happens a couple times a week. And then if research, it's a full research day, um, it's really a lot of meetings. I'm meeting with my laboratory staff, I'm ordering equipment, I'm writing papers, reading papers, making sure that, that things are going well. Uh, so me and my path. So um, I'm, my path is not linear. Um, I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was actually raised partially in Accra, Ghana, where my family is from. Um, so that's me um, uh, in the belly there. And so, the, you know, the question we're having is how do you go from there to, you know, giving talks, you know, being this was me as YMC chair, um, you know, when I was still a, a wee young neurosurgeon several years ago. Um, so, so my parents, um, you know, again, they came from Ghana, that's the X over here, moved to Milwaukee. Again, that's, that's, that's there. My mom came after college. My dad came for college. Um, that's me and my dad, uh, circa 1981. Uh, one of the quotes that, that they have, which I love, um, was work smart, not hard. Um, the idea of that is not that you shouldn't work hard, right? Um, but that you should use your energy wisely. Um, time management is incredibly important. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like what, what, what Dr. Wolf was saying. It's like when you're working intensely on something, you're working intensely on something. You're not watching YouTube videos and studying for your boards. You're studying for your boards. And that's it. And maybe you don't get to watch the NBA playoff game that night because, you know, there's a couple other things you need to do. Um, but if you do that and you can focus when you need to focus, then, you know, that, that maybe gives you a little bit more time to enjoy yourself when that work is done. Um, so this is my parents' hometown, it's Elmina, Ghana. Um, this is actually Elmina Castle. It's um, one of the oldest uh, freestanding remaining um, slave castles on the west coast of Africa. So my, my mom lived like kind of right here. You can't see it, but like the house um, that's just down the street from that. This is actually the street my dad grew up in, uh, in Elmina. Um, and so, you know, my dad had a pretty rapid rise and, you know, it's kind of an international businessman and, you know, whatever. So it was a great inspiration for me um, and just wanted to do better. Um, so from, you know, the time I was a kid, I knew I had to do something. I, I felt monumentous. You know, my the dad came from absolutely nothing. My parents gave me so much. Um, it was really important that I become successful at something that had um, some use. Uh, so uh, this is what we, I like to think that um, my siblings and I look like. This is me. I'm number two. Um, this is what we were like most of the time. I had two brothers, um, you know, who were all born within three years. So things got a little bit chaotic. Um, as far as my career, um, I actually write Gifted Hands when I was, uh, I was nine or 10. Um, we're not going to talk politics tonight, but as far as the book, um, what the book gave to me was, uh, you know, it was neurosurgery was this really difficult thing um, where you help people every day. It was a new challenge every day. It was very technically challenging. You work with your hands. And I was like, this is it. Love it. Okay. Boom. From the time I was like 10 o'clock, 10 years old on, I'm telling everybody I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. Um, and I was just thinking about clinical stuff, not really thinking about research. So when I was 11, moved back to Ghana, I was a bit of a culture shock. Um, you know, it was one TV channel, no malls. Um, but, you know, I ended up having a good time, um, lived there for six years, um, then spent one year in boarding school in Connecticut. Um, didn't love that uh, and decided to go as far away from New England as possible. Um, and so, um, you know, I didn't use my summers in the absolute best way possible in, in high school and going in, applied to NIH, didn't really get it, just kind of made a little bit of money on the side. Uh, but then I got into Stanford. And that was where I, I first um, started to look at um, research. Um, so my first real research opportunity was between my freshman and sophomore year of college. There was a thing called sophomore college. It was a three-week program. 
um, was on brain development. I loved it. Um, we we're going through all the seminal experiments in neuroscience. And even though the professor did not typically take anyone but juniors who were doing about to do honors into her lab, I just asked her, I was like, hey, love this class. You know, um, would you take me as a, as a research assistant? And she did. Um, at, when it ended up going from there to the University of Pennsylvania for uh, medical school, this is me actually uh, lobbying City Hall to ban smoking indoors with the presidents of the med school schools of uh, the other Philadelphia medical schools at the time. Um, so got involved in leadership uh, pretty early. Uh, this is us at an SNMA conference. Uh, so I had time to go to conferences and meet people back then when you could meet people in real life. And this is actually uh, Dr. Carson signing my, my Gifted Hands book. Uh, back in 2004, um, and uh, his politics were the same back then. So um, in Accra, actually in my uh, my third year, no, fourth year of medical school, I was actually able to go back to my parents' hometown uh, and practice neurosurgery in Accra, Ghana, in the capital city, um, actually in my parents' hometown. Um, similar to, to Dr. Wolf, um, you know, it was really a, an eye-opening experience just kind of seeing what they were able, able to accomplish with so little. Um, and it's just one of the things that, that um, has kept me grateful for the opportunities and the equipment and everything I have uh, uh, here in the US. So back to research. Medical school did one summer of research after MS1. Not too productive, it's hard to be productive in, in eight months, but did a project in my third year um, where I was able to present an abstract to the CNS. Um, and that was really the only thing, you know, published wise on my CV at that time. But the arms race and neurosurgery right now, I know it's a lot more publications that most medical students uh, come out with, but that was enough to whet my appetite for research and residency. Applied to 33 programs, interviewed at 13, uh, and you know, thankfully uh, managed to match at, at Emory University, uh, where again I'm, I'm now back at, at um, uh, as faculty. Now residency, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I had a rough start in residency. I'm, I made mistakes. Um, you know, I was a new kid coming in. The two other, my two co-residents, um, actually had done rotations at Emory, so they kind of knew them, and I was this unknown quantity. Um, but Everyone knew I worked hard. Everyone knew I really, really cared about what happened to the patients, what happened for the team. Um, and that reputation for honesty and you know, being a hard worker and being someone they could rely upon uh, carried me well. And the trophy I actually showed was a trophy that it was just kind of extra thing they did uh, at our graduation for myself and my, my co-chiefs uh, um, because of how well the service had run. And it was just, you know, they knew if, if they gave any of us a task, it was going to be taken care of. Um, research during residency, like Dr. Wolf said, I, you know, I had a fourth year residency that I took some time with. Um, I applied for a CNS fellowship. I was actually going to go to France. I had this whole plan. My wife and I were going to move to France and live there for six months and study endoscopic uh, surgery, and I didn't get it. So I ended up going to the NIH instead and spent eight months there. I published two first author papers and a third paper as well. Really got bitten by the research bug then. Decided at that point, after having that success, I wanted to run a lab. Um, applied to uh, neurosurgical oncology fellowships um, at MSK and MD Anderson. Ended up choosing to do a two-year fellowship at MD Anderson so I could have an additional year to do research. Um, and from there, I was able to um, go back to the NIH's faculty. So there was someone who asked about getting a PhD in the chat, and I answered in the chat, but um, you don't have to get a PhD uh, to be a neurosurgeon. You don't have to get a PhD to be, to be a neurosurgeon scientist, as I am. Um, a PhD does help. If you have a passion for something research-wise at the time you're applying to medical school, then go for it. Um, you should do it. Um, you should not do it because you think it's the only way to do research at the end of residency. If you don't have a particular passion for studying something at that time that you're in medical school, don't do it. Um, the research you do as an MD PhD will be at least seven years old uh, when you finish residency. So you will have to do some meaningful research in residency regardless. Doing a PhD will set you up to where you're going to know a lot of techniques and then that time you go into the lab, it might be a lot easier to get some research going. But again, a lot of different ways to do it um, if you don't do that. So again, I uh, did some, uh, some presentations at MD Anderson. Um, these are kind of the major areas of my research. I don't want to spend too much time here. Um, work on immune therapy for glioblastoma, as I mentioned. Um, and this is, I'll just talk really briefly on this clinical trial I'm doing. The general idea is we want to figure out how immune therapeutics given systematically, uh, systemically are, um, are, are working in the brain. So we do a biopsy on these patients. Um, when they get enrolled, these are recurrent glioblastoma patients that we know we're going to do a resection on. We do a biopsy up front, confirm they have a recurrence. 
place these microdialysis catheters in that allow us to measure cytokines, which is how the immune system communicates, right? Um, give one dose of immune therapeutic, um, and then take the tumor out. Um, and so in that way, we have tissue from before and afterwards. We have these cytokine measurements during, and we're able to kind of see how, how these patients respond. Uh, Work-life balance, Dr. Wolf talked about it, um, that, you know, you could do an hour-long talk just on that. I try to do other things. Uh, there are other things I'm passionate about. I try to cut down D time. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen a lot of the hit shows that are out right now that I really want to see that normal, you know, undergrad me would have watched because, you know, that's D time. It's just not that important. The things that are important are going on a bike ride with my kids, um, getting to my son's soccer game, um, you know, watching my, my daughter uh, dance recital, uh, things like that, things that are going to form memories that they're going to, re to remember. Um, and, you know, I think I'll end there. I had, I had one case I could show um, if we want to delay, if there's, there's time later, but um, I think we, we need to get to the panel and, and questions, so. That's, that's really, true, really, really wonderful, Edja. Thank you so much for, for um, that presentation. Outstanding, outstanding. Both, both presentations are phenomenal. So um, with that, I want to open this up for just general discussion. So we've heard a lot of talking, and now we want to have more like, uh, you know, lecturing, so to speak, in, in a lot of ways. Now we want to have some conversation. So I want to invite um, Wally and Dave to maybe kick us off. Any points that you guys want to add, uh, questions you want to ask the, the, the speakers? Um, Wally being an attending, um, Dave soon to be, um, but to just a little bit earlier in the path than uh, than Edge and Stacy. Any anything? Um, we'll start with you, Wally. Uh, any questions you have or comments you want to add? Sure. Yeah, I, I thought I agree with every single thing that was said today, except the functional neurosurgeon thing, obviously by Dr. Woods. But uh, obviously, the what Dr. Wood, yeah, the uh, what Dr. Wolf actually said there was one of the first times I've heard it but probably the best advice uh, for these students, I'm assuming most of you guys are medical students trying to decide to whether to go into neurosurgery, trying to spend six months to talk yourself out of it. And that seems really petrifying. And you think throughout all of medical school, you're going to go in uh, and having to set yourself up doing the research, going to the things, you know, meeting all of the doctors, et cetera. Six months in the grand scheme of things is nothing. I went through college, I started college, I forgot, I think um, 16 or something like that. I thought I had to go straight through to college, straight through to med school and straight through to residency, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I went to med school thinking I was gonna be a neurosurgeon. And then I started having people tell me that neurosurgeons are, are horrible people. And probably, you know, some time ago, there's probably some truth to that. And that you never see your family, you can't spend time with them, but I think our, uh, wonderful uh, speakers today kind of dismantled that thought. But I had that in my head when I first started in medical school. So I actually spent two years, actually a better part of two years, saying I'm not going to do neurosurgery. I looked at anesthesia, I looked at CT surgery, and I looked at neurology. And, you know, I was a neuroscience major in college, and I thought neuroscience, you know, it's all the same thing. I'll tell you it's not. I don't think there's uh, a, not an easy way to say it, but neurosurgeons and neurologists are like a picture of Edge's brothers in that hallway there. They're, they just don't get along. Maybe Dr. Wolf has some better luck there as a, <laughs> a dual trained uh, trainee, but uh, as an open neurovascular surgeon, I don't think that's the case. But it helped me tremendously. It cost me two years. I spent a year of research between my third year and fourth year of medical school. And for a lot of you guys in the panel, that probably sounds petrifying to you. But I'll tell you, that was the best academic decision of my life, taking a year to do research, getting my head straight. And once I did that, there was nothing that really um, was more clear to me than wanting to do this. And that's all I would say. That's great. Great. Uh, Dave, any comments, questions you have? Yeah, no. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, kinda, I agree with uh, a lot of what's, what's already been said. I think the the time to kind of self-reflect and, and really figure out if this is what you want to do is, is very important. Um, uh, and I say that coming from a, a standpoint of I didn't do that. Um, I, when I jumped into neurosurgery and kind of found it, I immediately loved it and then just started like running at it as hard as I possibly could and never really thought twice about it. So luckily it worked out for me. Um, but I've met a bunch of people along the way who didn't do that. They, they were enamored by, <clears throat> 
by the profession, by some of the, I mean, just the amazing surgeries that we get to do and just the amazing impact we get to have on people's lives. But they really didn't think much about kind of the, the work that's required and, and the effort that's required going into it. Um, so that's, that's very important. And I really liked what Stacy said. It's something I always tell all of my uh, mentees, but just live in the moment. I mean, you're working really hard. You obviously want to keep your work-life balance appropriate, but you've got research stuff. You've got a bunch of clinical, obviously, responsibilities. Um, you've got people in organized neurosurgery that are, are calling you or texting you or emailing you and just different tasks to, to go after. And it really, I really like the, the comment to just live just full bore on one thing at a time and then just i mean it, it gets very schizophrenic i live a very schizophrenic life uh but yeah it's just you just go at it as hard as you can with whatever you're doing whether it's your family or, or whatever else but um i guess i have one question for uh uh, uh stacy and Edja. oh i did i wanted to especially thank stacy for showing us the picture of little jeremiah i greatly appreciated that moment <laughs> um but uh <clears throat> so as little as Edja was in that one picture <laughs> <laughs> true true <laughs> um or even for any of the other panelists too have you guys ever had a period in your med medical school training or residency training where you just felt discouraged or burnt out and what did you guys do how did you overcome and, and get past that yesterday yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's it's definitely before i answer that question i i do want to follow up on um you know how how do you go and figure out or talk yourself out of you know and so i, I do want to clarify that a little bit because for some people you know like wally it's take that year and do research but that doesn't mean you have to do a research year right for me what it looked like was i did rotation on all of the subspecialties, um, which was one of the best things that I did. And I loved everything except family medicine because they had to send their patients to somebody else. Like they didn't, couldn't take care of anybody, uh, not because they weren't capable, but it just wasn't a thing. And so, so I said, that's, that's definitely not for me. But, you know, I loved ortho and I loved uh, plastics and I loved vascular. Um, and, and neurosurgery was just all of those things, you know, put together. So it's gonna, that's going to look a little bit different to everybody. Don't feel like you have to do a year of research. But if you want to, you know, if you have that curiosity, it's a great time, you know, to be able to, to look at stuff. Don't feel like you have to fit into a prescribed pattern. Um, I think everybody's journey is going to look a little bit different, um, you know. And so, so anyways, I just wanted that to, to be thrown out there. Um, as far as do you have those moments where you are just burned out, exasperated? Absolutely. Um, and especially now, I will say Edja is, he is much more stable than I am. And, and so he actually said the same thing as me, but in a much better way to be in intentional about what you're doing uh, you know and so there is there's that balance between going full bore and, and just being intentional about what you're doing you probably get less burned out that way um, you know but but it, it is I, here let me I'll, I'll give you a tour of my desk you see it it just keeps going keeps going and uh, those are all of the things that I'm supposed to have done um, by two weeks ago and uh, you know and it's one of these that oh if, if you sit down and just look at all the things that you haven't done it's it's staggering right we're never going to be able to do all of the things that we want to do because we're that kind of person you know you're driven um you know you say yes to everything another very important piece of advice that shelly timmons taught me is that you never say no but you can't say yes to everything so here's what you do you say yes i have a person for you and so then again it's that idea of you know absolutely we'll get that taken care of for you you're still the go-to person uh but now you're also elevating somebody else that you work with that needs that opportunity because nobody's going to come and ask your very junior partner you know to be the person um but if you work with them together you don't have to say no but you also don't have to do all the things uh you know and so i think that it is edja probably has many better ideas of how not to uh you know get exasperated burned out or what have you um you know for me i'm you know i'm a, I'm a um a god is very important in my life and and you i need that you know to know that there's there's somebody who's actually orchestrating all of this and my job is to do the best 
that I can at every task that I am given. Um, I have family to fall back on. I have partners who are amazing. Uh, I have these guys, you know, on the, <laughs> I just, I got another job uh, the other day and I immediately called Jeremiah and said, ah, we have to have a meeting about how we're going to do this with NREF, you know, and so that those contacts, um, you're not in this alone. This really is neurosurgery is a team sport. And I think that that is one of the biggest things that helps me to be able to keep going when it gets hard because it does get hard. That's awesome. I wanted to bring in the medical students here, but I, I just based on you all your discussion, I want to emphasize uh, that I agree with everything that you guys have all said and they all have nuggets of truth. In my mind, there's so many different backgrounds and ways to get there. I don't want everyone to think there's one way. And I think that's one of the reasons that's very interesting for us to present all of our stories and our and, and see how circuitous and different the paths are to get to where we are at the end, right? Um, so uh, with that- let, let me take, just I just wanna say one quick thing. Um, I saw a question, I feel really bad. That slide about the thing with the Sanjay Gupta and whatever, that was a joke. You don't have to have all those things. Right. Um, that, the point of that slide I, I was- I responded to that for you, <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, I saw Stacey respond to the Q&A, but in case I was going too fast, again, no, you don't have to have the Einstein and the photographic, no, it, that's a joke. That's what people think. But if you're interested, follow it up, work hard. Okay, great. That's it. Very good. Uh, Keon, um, Anthony, uh, any, any questions for the panel? Uh, you know, I, at your guys' stage, I mean, one thing I thought of when we were talking is that, you know, all of these things about mentors and advice, uh, what, what has your experience been now that there's less in-person experiences in neurosurgery? How is this impacting you? Um, uh, is one question I have for you, but first of all, do you guys have any questions for the panel or anything you would like to interject into this? Yeah, so um, just to speak to your question um, quickly, um, one of the things that has attracted, I think, both of us to neurosurgery is the, um, the adaptability and sort of the, um, the ability to, um, you know, think on your feet and, and you know, maneuver in a way to um, deliver the best um, you know, education and care um, for students and patients. Um, and so in the setting of um, this crazy year that we've been going through, the way the neurosurgical community, I mean, Anthony and I even wrote an article on it, the way the neurosurgical community has come together um, to basically improve access to neurosurgical education, um, research opportunities, um, you know, you name it, has been absolutely incredible. And, um, and you know, this webinar is a testament to that. So, so thank you so much for you all putting this on. And um, that's one of the most attractive parts of the field to me. And, and I'm sure Anthony as well. Um, yeah. I, did have, I did have a quick question. Um, so Drs. Wolf and, and Duam, thank you so much for those outstanding talks. Um, each of you have been an integral part of a technological and scientific revolution in the field of neurosurgery. Dr. Wolf with the burgeoning of endovascular surgery becoming a critical piece of the neurosurgery repertoire. Dr. Nduam with your basic and translational research on immunotherapy for CNS tumors. I was wondering if you could just look forward, or, and this is for any of the panelists as well, look forward 10 to 20 years in the future, um, you know, put yourself in our position. Uh, what do you think is sort of like on the precipice of becoming the next revolution in the delivery of neurosurgical care? I want to put on my moderator hat real quickly. Um, this is programmed to end at 7.30, so we got a, like 18 minutes. So the, well, um, these are beautiful questions, and we just want to leave time for the, for the attendee questions as well. So. I'll go real quick. For, for brain tumors, it's personalized medicine. Um, getting samples, processing the sample, figuring out exactly what the, the thing you want to target in that brain tumor is, and then attacking that. And then maybe resampling to see if it has a new target. Um, I think that's the direction that, that brain tumor surgery and then the care of those patients will go. I'm not a functional surgeon, but I do think that, you know, um, brain modulation is clearly coming along by leaps and bounds. Uh, you know, memory processes, uh, you know, being able to create motor movement, uh, you know, through, through brain chips uh it's it's just truly phenomenal um and i i'm not smart enough to know all the things about that but uh that's why you guys are here because it's really going to take just thinking outside of the box and and being creative uh and coming up with these new things i mean it really there's we we can't even think about what's going to be happening it's, it's going to be so exciting and you know it's funny to see 
I came into this in 2002. I remember very clearly sitting in Dr. Harris's conference. He was fit to be tied because this crazy study called ISAT came out and these heretics were saying that you should coil aneurysms and not clip them. And it was just, I mean, for two years, they railed against this. We wrote articles. It was a terrible thing. And then three years later, he came to me and said, Stacy, I think you need to train as an endovascular surgeon. Uh, you know, and it's just seeing just how this all comes about. It's amazing. Ag agreed. Um, awesome. Anthony, any, any questions or comments that you wanted to add? Um, so first, uh, you know, thank you for putting this all up. This is a fantastic experience. Um, I'm a third year medical student as Kian is as well. Um, this would have been great a few years ago. We've been fortunate to learn a lot of these things as we've gone. Um, but this has been a great opportunity. Um, so I have a question to kind of bring it back to who might think about becoming a neurosurgeon. Um, and anyone can please chime in. Um, so I think a lot of us here probably are, are aware or are becoming more aware that you know neurosurgery, from what I can see, is it really attracts some of the best and brightest students, some of the hardest working students um, in, in most of our medical school classes. And with that, um, I've always had this thought in the back of my head is, you know, the best and brightest and the hardest working students, they could probably excel in many specialties, not just neurosurgery. Do um, you have any advice or any thoughts about, about that specifically? And how is it that you finally come to that decision? Is neurosurgery over plastic surgery or anesthesia or neurology, whatever, whatever it might be? Because I, I really do have a sense that many of us could excel in other specialties as well. I, mean, I think Stacy said it really well earlier, Dr. Wolf, um, in that, you know, trying to convince yourself otherwise. I, I used to tell mentees that all the time. It's basically, you do neurosurgery if you hate everything else. If you like neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery, you're an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> if you like neurosurgery and ENT, you're an ENT. Um, because, you know, it's a shorter path. Um, they are also very well compensated. There are cool, I, you know, I'll be honest, there are some cool surgeries in ortho, if you're into the big bone banging thing. Um, and same thing in the ENT and retinal surgeons. So, you know, but if, if opening the brain sets a thing off in your, your head and, you know, working on someone's spine and working on critical processes um, and, and knowing that, you know, someone's life is in your hands. I mean, if that's something that, you know, you're like, I, I have to do that. I have to help people in this specific way. Then neurosurgery is for you. You're, you're right. Uh, neurosurgeons would be phenomenally successful in other things. And there are some even former neurosurgery trainees who go on to other specialties and are phenomenal because they were very smart when they came into neurosurgery and they're, they, they're still very smart when they went to the other thing. Um, but on that, the burnout thing, you will have burnout moments. I had several burnout moments. I have had moments I thought I was going to get fired. Um, and in those moments where it's dark, if you have the guiding light of, I know what the end of the tunnel looks like and this is what I have to do, you will get back up and you will push through and you will do what needs to be done to, to survive and, and to do well and thrive. And if you don't have that, if in the back of your mind is, well, I, I could have been an ENT. <laughs> well, you're gonna go be an ENT because it's easier. <laughs> um, nothing against ENTs, they have great surgeries and you know all this sort of stuff, but it, it's, it is difficult. It, it is difficult to be a neurosurgery trainee. So you, it is really important to love it. That's beautifully said. Um, all right. I want to move to the questions. We have about 10 to 15 maximum minutes left before Zoom ends our session here. Uh, maybe next time we'll make it a little longer. That way we don't cut off and we can answer all the questions. So if you don't get your question answered, I apologize. We'll try to do it in some other format. Um, join us next week as well. Um, Anna, uh, any questions that stood out to you when to ask the panel? Yes, there was a question that was emailed to us. Uh, it says, it was from Lior. He is a medical student. He said, what advice can you give to a student that was really interested in neurosurgery since before medical school and it still is and has put in the effort to shadow and do research in neurosurgery, but is not sure if the interest stems from ambition or prestige of uh, the field rather than, uh, that rather than interest. Um, in the field. 
That, that's a that's a hard question, and I think it comes down to we we all struggled with that. Um, every neurosurgeon struggled with that, and let's be honest, there's some of both. Um, most neurosurgeons definitely go into neurosurgery in part because of the challenge of it, right? Uh, and that's that's a personality type, and it makes you a great neurosurgeon. Um, you know, in addition, you have to love the field and love the specialty. But let let's be honest, I don't love every single surgery to the max, uh, you know, that I do. Um, I enjoy all of them, but I don't have a deep passion for absolutely every single type of surgery. That's why people subspecialize. Um, but I do have an absolute passion for people with neurosurgical disease, right? This is a specialty. There's a lot of acuity to it. Um, you know, you're helping people in their darkest and their families in their darkest moments, um, you know, that, that most people can't even comprehend or think about some of the situations that our patients come in with, you know, and so there's, there's that acuity, there's that, uh, you know, you're challenging yourself, you have to be able to do it all, you have to be able to do it with energy and stamina, um, you have to have that wonder, like Ed just said, uh, you know, to pull you through um, and to make you keep wanting to go, and so it's, it's okay to want to pursue something because it's challenging and other people can't do it. That's why we're neurosurgeons, you know? Not everybody can do this job truly. Um, and, and that's good. That means that we have good job security. Excellent, uh, that is a great answer. Um, any other questions that you wanna highlight here, Anna? Uh, th this one I, I have too. Uh, Cassie asked, being compassionate towards our patients is super important. So do you think being too compassionate, caring, is um, detrimental to our mental, emotional health since the population we treat usually uh, have grim outcomes? I mean, I can take this as a glioblastoma surgeon. Um, so, uh, you know, glioblastoma, which I study and operate on, has an abysmal prognosis. Um, and I was told by people actually going into neurosurgery that I was too nice to do neurosurgery. That's what my medical school classmates actually said. Uh, and I disagree with that. Um, so the job of a, of, a, of a glioma surgeon, a glioblastoma surgeon, in many ways is to be there on the worst day of someone's life or some family's lives um, and be the one that guides them through it in the gentlest way possible. Um, to get them through the surgery safely, to take as much of the tumor out, to, to prolong their life, to explain what's going on to them in such a way that it doesn't ruin the rest of everybody's life that, that's, that's, that's um, involved with that. And that's a pretty big job and a big responsibility. And again, some people want to do that. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, but, you know, it's really important to me. And I, I feel very strongly for my patients and I advocate very strongly for my patients and I do research so that I can hopefully change the future for these patients so that I'm not having that same discussion with, with patients, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Um, but yeah, no, being compassionate is, is a very, very strong plus. Um, you know, the, the best neurosurgeons that I know, families love them. Um, because of the time they spent with them, because they look them in the eye and they explain what's going on and they put a hand on them, their knee. Even in COVID times, I put a glove on, I put a hand on their knee and I tell them, you know, we're going to work through this together. We're going to give you the best possible start to treatment for this disease. And, you know, we're going to give you a treatment that's going to help. I can't cure it. Um, but, you know, we're going to do our very best and you're going to get the very best possible care that you can get here. And I think patients and families appreciate that. And that's what helps me deal with it. That's a beautiful answer, Edgen. I think it also goes back to something Stacy said is we're still doctors. Um, and you still, the, the, the things that made us want to become doctors also hopefully carry through to be nurses, just compassion, caring for people, wanting to make people better. And even if we can't, we still can give them the compassion and the hope and, 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 and you know, with the, the framing of having done this before and guiding them through this process. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, it's wonderfully said. Uh, Anna, any other questions that caught your eye here? Looks like we have about seven more minutes. Um, maybe this one. Sebara asks, I am an under, undergraduate student. How can I gain exposure to neurosurgery or neurology early on? 
Sure, I think it's really important to work with your medical school about that. You know, it was interesting, um, several years back, I actually had to, I had to talk with the deans um, because they didn't realize for neurosurgery um, that a lot of this exposure needs to come earlier than in other subspecialties. Uh, you know, and so don't be afraid to advocate for yourself to make opportunities. That's, that's been one of my lessons uh, that I've learned throughout the years and that I've conversely tried to to, um, create opportunities now that I'm in a position to do so. Um, it might the journey might not always look like exactly what you expected. I think Edja certainly uh, said that well. Mine certainly did not look. I mean, it, it took so many uh, turns and switchbacks and what have you. But uh, I, you know, grasp what's there in front of you. You know, and go ahead and go to your neurosurgery department and knock on someone's door or send out an email or, you know, uh, talk with your dean and say, hey, I'd really like to do a rotation in neurosciences. Nobody's asking to do a rotation in neurosciences, I promise. There's going to be a spot for you, uh, you know, and so, so you, just, you just have to ask uh, and don't, don't be afraid. You can do it in a very respectful uh, manner. Obviously, you recognize that neurosurgeons and neuroscientists are busy, um, but almost uniformly, they want their, their teachers at heart, um, you know, so ask, ask the question. And I agree, and I think that uh, as well, uh, the only way, you, I've seen several questions like, how do you know you want to get into this? How do I get exposure? I really think the way you know if you want to do this or not is to actually get that exposure, which COVID is making harder. But I think you need to spend as much time as you can in neurology and neurosurgery and integrating yourself into the, into the field to understand it and see if you really want to do it. Um, and those that can't live without it, as we've said, that, that's for you. Um, we'll get into a lot more of these types of issues in the next installment, which is, um, which is uh, about how to prepare yourself to be competitive to match in neurosurgery. Much more detail about if you're a medical student, how do you, how, what do you need to have on your CV? What does it look like to match in neurosurgery? So that'll be next week. Stacy will be joining us again with, along with Ricardo Comatar, who is the program director at University of Miami. And I did have, um, if you guys will indulge me, a few more slides to close because it looks like we have five minutes. I think it may be a little bit short on time to answer too many more questions here before we get cut off. I don't want to get cut off in the middle of a sentence. So let me, uh, let me just put a few final slides up here. If you guys will indulge that and we will close this uh, down. We have an email address here, um, which I will um, put up again and is also in the Q&A in, in the chat. Um, that uh, if you have any questions, you want to, we'll, we'll try to we'll try to get back to you if you didn't get any of your question answered. I think some of the questions we kind of answered through the discussion. So again, next week, um, here is uh, our um, our next week's topic. Please fill out the surveys when you register, and you'll get one uh, about three or four or five weeks from now. It's like a follow up survey. This is very important for us to understand how we're doing, what we need to do better, um, and also show that what we're doing is worth all this effort for people. Um, I did want to announce one thing that is very important for our committee, which is a, um, a fund. So NREF, as we said, is like the philanthropic arm of NS. And uh, one of the things that we want to do as nurse surgeons is give back. Um, so the Young Nurse Surgeons Committee has started a fund to honor one of the people that have worked with our committee for over 20 years, who's retiring this year. Her name is Chris Phillips. Um, the, we accept donations, but go to a fund account. Um, th this account then is used after we get a certain amount of money into it to help sponsor more medical student involvement in our committee and national neurosurgery in general. If you're at all interested or know someone that may be interested to donate, um, there's a donation page here, um, which we can also um, put into the chat. Um, something else I wanted to say is that, again, if you have more questions and you want some feedback or you want to give feedback about what you want to hear more of, um, what we should do a future topic on, please email us at webinarsync at gmail.com. Um, this recording will be processed and eventually, hopefully not too long, posted on the NREF um, YouTube page. Um, so that you can share it with other people that may want to see it or watch it again, et cetera. Um, and again, we will announce when those links come out on our Twitter and Instagram accounts, uh, which you can follow at the handle at Young Neurosurgeons or at Young Neurosur. Um, so follow us on social media. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. I really want to thank all the panelists for coming. This has been, in my opinion, if I was a student, I would be loving all this information and to share your journey and your insights.
insights and your wisdom. Thank you to the panelists, Wally Sivakumar, David Jornbos, as well as our two students who asked really excellent questions, Kian and uh, Anthony. And um, if any, anybody has any further comments, I'm happy to hear them. But otherwise, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for putting it together. No, my pleasure. Um, I, there's a lot of other questions, so Thanks, I, I'm going to try and answer some of these offline. I'm sorry for that. There were so many we didn't get to, but we just ran out of time today, and I don't want to get cut off. So I appreciate everyone's attention. I'm going to stop my screen share here. And uh, Edja, Stacy, and the whole team, we will see you guys soon. It's great talking to you again. Really proud of the young neurosurgeons. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, I'm going to end the meeting. Is that okay, Becky? All right.